Hello and welcome to another episode of Five Alarm Task Force. I'm your host, Steve Green. We're happy to have you with us. We hope you'll drop by our website, 5 alarmtaskforcecorporate.org. And when you do, take a tour, look at everything, especially the tab that says our mission for a new project, a new nonprofit project, Five Alarm Task Force Corp Foundation. Our goal is one. Our motto is one family, one mission, first responders helping each other. And all of the webcast, all of the website, you'll have an opportunity to donate if you so desire. And uh, that'll be a big help to us. Tonight, we're happy to bring back another installment of Make Do with my good friends and well-experienced firefighters, Captain Nick Peppard and Sean Duffy. And I'm going to turn it over to them. So Captain Nick, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, glad to be back here. Uh, had to do a little finagling to make this episode uh, take place, but uh, glad everybody was able to make it happen. Um, I just, uh, real quick, a little bit about me for anybody listening who might not know, 15 years on the job, um, career fireman up here in Northwest Florida. Uh, went to uh, Tallahassee for a few years and down to Tampa, Hillsborough area, but uh, came back home. i uh, been up here ever since the uh, last four years. I'm a captain with the Holly Navarre Fire District in Northwest Florida, uh, mainly suburban uh, environment. Um, and that's kind of what this segment is about, uh, talking about suburban fire tactics. Uh, really, really excited to be uh, here with some good friends tonight. Uh, you know, Sean Duffy, um, you know, uh, Kurt Isaacs and Shannon Stone, all guys that uh, I highly respect, have a lot, uh, a lot of good things to uh, you know, say about them. But uh, I'm sure we'll get into that uh, as we go, uh, some of their experiences through their careers uh, on the suburban fire ground. And uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll introduce our guest uh, briefly, and then I'll let Sean kind of wrap up at the end here. Um, Chief Ike, uh, Kurt, Is Kurt Isaacson, uh, most people know him from uh, County Fire Tactics, CF Tactics. Um, they do a series of conferences up here in the Panhandle. Um, he's been uh, on the job now, uh, what, over 30 years, right, Chief? Uh, yeah, well, career, I guess. I don't know what it is. I, I already collected a pension if I didn't change the job. So I, I think 28 years paid. I got you. I got you. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, been on the job for a little while. Uh, started up here in the same area we're at right now. Uh, Northwest Florida. Started in Midway. Uh, worked his way up through the ranks. Uh, junior firefighter. Captain. Uh, ended up in the city of Pensacola for, I believe, nine years. Uh, on Rescue 31 there. Um, was a company officer on that uh, apparatus. And uh, then he's been with Escambia County for... 19-ish years uh, and uh, serves as a battalion chief with the Scammy County Fire Rescue. Uh, Well-versed in suburban fire tactics. Uh, that his whole uh, county fire tactics is kind of centered around that mindset and, and kind of a little bit of everything in the county. Um, and uh, I think I, you know, pretty pretty much uh, said the, the, the background. Uh, most people know you, Chief, uh, like I said, with all the training and stuff at HROC and some of the other conferences. Um, but uh, definitely, definitely excited to uh, talk shop with you tonight. Uh, Shannon, Shannon Stone, uh, recently, recently retired uh, Fort Walton Beach Fire Department. Uh, pushing up on 30 years yourself, aren't you, Chief? Yeah, just over 30 years. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, retired from Fort Walton Beach as a battalion chief, and uh, he, uh, he wanted to come hang out in Santa Rosa County with us boys over here. So he uh, took, a, took a position with the Midway Fire District, which is – one district over from mine, uh, serves as a division chief of operations with Midway and uh, has been instrumental with the uh, joint training program that we've been doing with the three county south end departments here over the last year. Um, but uh, both these guys have taught at multiple conferences, uh, FDIC, uh, MAFC, Firehouse Expo. Um, so pretty, pretty well versed instructors, well versed firemen. Um, and uh, like I said, we're excited to have you guys here tonight and look forward to uh, talking fire tech. Okay. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll wrap it up. Um, for you who don't know, my name is Sean Duffy. Uh, I've been in the fire service. November will be 16 years for me. Um, had a little bit of an opportunity to work all over the end of the spectrum. Uh, suburban, rural, volunteer career. Uh, so the purpose of today uh, is really to just bring awareness to the fact that we have the same purpose when we go to the fire ground, no matter what positions we are in the fire service, right? In the suburban setting, uh, the difference for us a lot plays a role on the tactics we choose, and that's what makes our success. Um, so same objective, different tactics. So I want to kind of touch on that stuff tonight. I think that we have two very experienced guests here to help us with that. Uh, so 
Chief uh, Isaacson, I know that one of your biggest things when you show up is um, time delayed tactics and everything like that. So if you wouldn't mind, if you want to kick it off, just to bring awareness of how, how things go for you on your fire grounds with your limited staffing in the area that you service. Well, um, you know, mine has kind of evolved um, over the last 20 years, um, more so the last, you know, 16 years as a battalion chief going from, you know, one engine company with four people, 690 gallons, and myself going to a fire with no backup to today, you know, I can't really come, you know, plane as a whole, it's a, it's a, you know, everything's relative. It's totally different on what we get on the fire ground. But, you know, the, um, one of the, the first, you know, topics that Nick sent me was, you know, brief review of suburban fire department challenges. And, you know, I kind of like thought about that a lot when he sent it to me. And I think the biggest, you know, don't get me wrong, talking, you know, public, you know, firefighters, city managers, county commissioners, there's no doubt that we do not have the adequate staffing that we need. We don't have the staffing that urban firefighters, you know, have and should have. But once you realize you don't have that, it's kind of like don't waste your time or oxygen, you know, talking about it. So just, you know, figure out what you can do with the people you have. And that was kind of my mindset, um, you know, in the summer of 20, 2004 when I went on 24-hour shift and, you know, in a large metro county with four people is, that, you know, excuses at 2 o'clock in the morning, they, they really don't matter when there's nobody there to listen. There's no podcast. There's no audience. It's a house is on fire. There's nobody standing in the street. It's, it's for them and myself. And that's when you start learning to, to make the most of it and, and do what you can. So, you know, I think for us in a fire service is just, you know, having a, a mindset of embracing urban tradition, urban culture, urban successes. I'll just say urban successes and doing the best we can without making excuses. And I'll just kind of leave it at that as, is trying to, you know, create an urban success on a suburban fire ground without making excuses. And don't get me wrong, there's a time and a place for the union presidents, the fire chief, to work on making progress for staffing. But when you roll out the door, as, you know, uh, Scamby County Fire Rescue did the night before last, and they're pulling up in a very urban area with a, you know, a university trauma center, like, uh, like literally 100 yards away, you had a commercial building fire and there's confirmed entrapment and a commercial commercial occupancy, you know, like right then is not the time to argue out in the street politics. It's like what now what you have to do is you have to do everything you can. And then you leave, you know, the, the, you know, the debate, I guess I don't like the word excuses because it is justifiable. You leave the debate to somebody else. And that's taken me a long time to just kind of mature wise and realize on what we're doing. Yeah. Very well put. Excellent, excellent uh, point. And that kind of goes to the topic of the, the podcast, right? Make do. Uh, we don't make excuses, we make do. You know, we do what we got to do to get the job done uh, in spite of our resources uh, and despite the fact that oftentimes we have longer response times. Our second due may be, you know, it may not be a minute out, maybe it's three or four minutes out, right? So um, in suburban fire ground, it's, it's very much a, a adapt and overcome kind of uh, a situation we're in. Um, and coming from a previously working on a two-man engine, you know, now having four guys in the truck, still in a suburban setting. But, uh, you know, back then you look back like, well, how do you, how do, you do that? And uh, at the end of the day, you just find ways. You find a way to, to get the job done. You find a way to, to be, you know, as aggressive as you can, make, you know, make a good decisions um, and try to give the people that are, that are trapped the best chance, that, you know, that they're going to have at surviving. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, do our job along the way, put the fire out, and, and you know, we all get to talk about it at the firehouse. But uh, uh, well put, Chief. Uh, uh, Chief Stone, you want to maybe throw in kind of your ideas and thoughts on on the, you know, the limited uh, staffing situation we face up here in, uh, in this part of the state and across the country. Um, some of your experiences with doing doing the job with less than stellar resources sometimes. Yeah, it's a, uh, I mean, it's, it, it can be a challenge for sure. You know, I've, you know, I, you know, I agree, you know, a lot of what Kurt says, I mean, you know, coming from a department where I retired at, where we typically had the staffing to work in here with you in Santa Rosa County where the staffing's so spread out. I mean, the reality is, is that I think that, that the firefighters actually have to be a little bit more talented. And that may be unpopular and 
in some groups, but, but uh, you know, when you're talking time delay tactics and, well, you know, the townhouse fire that we had, what, a couple months ago, you guys were tied up on a fire on the beach and, uh, you know, we had a row of townhomes going and, and I got there before the engines and I looked at the chief and I said, where are the engines at? He just kind of laughed at me. He's like, they're coming. And then we had one there for like eight or nine minutes. Then we had another one, yeah. second due. And then the third due was like another 10 or 15. It's just the challenges you face with that are, 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 are I don't want to say are monumental, but there are a whole lot of different challenges. And understanding how that you can get multiple tasks done uh, with limited staffing um, is instrumental. And then, of course, the whole foundation of that is, is the training and the expectations and preparing those guys uh, to make those decisions, you know, very much like they did that night. I mean, we uh, single-handedly with a couple of chiefs and two engines uh, through, through talent and probably a little bit of luck, we, we kept six townhomes from burning down and kept it to one. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges and, you know, and Kurt, you know, he, he beats it like a, a dead horse as it should be. It all reverts back to our preparation and training and, and, you know, and, and we'll see the results when, when we're out there and we're running the calls. Sure. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely more of a challenge, but you know, the solution is, is the same, whether it's urban or suburban and it's training preparation. Yeah. Well put there, Chief. And uh, one thing I want to add to that is I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of, as firefighters, whatever position you happen to be riding for that day or whatever size department you are, or whatever your staffing levels is, um, it's really important that you know all aspects of your job, right? And not just your job, but everybody else's job. So in this particular type of setting, two guys, three guys maybe, if you're lucky, um, you have to take a quick assessment of that scene you have to develop the game plan. You have to start setting that into play, but you have to also be able to do that while you're walking up. So let's say you are second due or something like that. In your mind, you already have to prepare yourself for the assignment that is given. And how you do that is take, take a look at the scene. All right, I already got ventilation or I already got fire tax. So most likely they're going to want search or whatever that is. And I feel where we kind of fail in today's fire environment is that firefighters are being are waiting to be told what to do. They don't have that, that critical thinking skill of, of looking ahead and saying, okay, all this is set in place, but this hasn't been done yet. This is probably most likely what I'm going to do and preparing for that assignment before they even get them. So um, as chiefs, what are your thoughts on having a particular firefighter like that or even a crew like that? Um, do you think that leads to more success or do you think that that's something that, that falls back on? Uh, training of uh, the crew or the officer. Go ahead, Chief. It's all you. <laughs> no, you want to. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there, there's, you know, I, I want to be careful because at the end of the day, I think we have um, people infiltrate our podcast from the government side. Um, you know, we we as firefighters, I think, do a phenomenal job as much as we, I got, I got a preface before I give you the answer. <laughs> we sit around a firehouse and we, we know what we need and it is justifiable. We know that people live and die based on staffing and training. There's no doubt about that. Absolutely. You know, um, first and foremost, for me, the most important staffing happens to be Midway where I live uh, for my family. And it's just like tonight, I know that the Midway Fire Department has another crew coming in. And I'm willing to pay for that as a taxpayer. So I say that first and foremost, that it's not for me, just it's not a game. I, I truly believe it. I, I think some of most, my most the stress that I carry around is calls that I've been to where I knew that if I had not better trained firefighters, I just had more firefighters because, you know, I've been fortunate. I worked with some phenomenal firefighters and the questions, from, you know, is a great question, but we did need more people. But you know, I'm just going to drop a name, you know, because, you know, people that are in the job are late. I, I think about a Larry McCormack from Squad 5 in Chicago. Um, just a humble gentleman. It wouldn't matter if he worked in Chicago or if he worked in Navarre, he worked in Midway. It really wouldn't matter where he worked. He would be a standout firefighter. And ideally, if, 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 if every firefighter on the job was Larry, we would, it would just be a simple world. And it would make it tougher for us to, you know, fight for that. But that's not reality. You know, we have to do what Chief Brunacini, you know, taught us decades ago that this is a job and there's a certain level of expectation that has to be realistic. And we ask everybody to do that. And then there's going to be those people that are beyond that. You know, 
you know, Larry, and it, and it didn't, ha- it didn't matter. He works in an urban fire department. Larry would be like that if he worked in any fire department. And so there's no doubt that, you know, the more that we can get suburban firefighters to um, get into all aspects of the jobs because they have to, we're going to perform more. I'll go back to my opening thing. You know, I didn't have, I couldn't make excuses at two o'clock in the morning when it was engine 319 in the center of Escambia County, literally next to Pensacola Christian College and myself, you know, going through a lot of fires that, you know, I, I could complain in staff meetings. I could complain to the, to the, you know, the chiefs, but at two o'clock in the morning, there was no complaint. I was figuring out how the four of them, myself and 690 gallons of water, unless we, you know, laid it and, you know, left it like, you know, like a, a fast, you know, leaving it line dry we had to figure out what we were going to do. So, you know, um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I will say that I think that suburban firefighters that are into this job and they find the proper balance will, you know, we'll be able to continue to do the best we can and make a difference to a certain level. Um, But we will, you know, we do need to be achieving that staff and, as Navarre has where Nick's from and, and Midway where Chief Stone's from because both of those departments were doing phenomenal jobs. They were pulling up on a fully involved garage of an attached house, hitting it with a two and a half. Navarre had one, I don't know, two or two years ago and I saved the picture. It's a beautiful house in Holly by the Sea. I didn't go to it, but smoke pushing all the way around. They put a large amount of water on the garage and they got some people on the roof and, you know, I, I they, they might not have saved the house in essence of like keeping it from being bulldozed, but they saved the content. I don't have to go to the house. I know they saved the content and that's what we're supposed to do. And, you know, do the best we can. And eventually the numbers will come up to, to show that we need the additional staffing. I, I kind of got off on a rant there because I get that. I hate that question because the, the real truth is, is if we put four Larry's on a rig and nobody else came, the job would get done. So I'll leave it at that and let Shannon talk. But, um, you know, I get real worried about saying what we can do. It's like, you know, what can SEAL Team 6 do compared to, you know, the number it would take of just, I hate to use the word average, you know, soldiers, but it's the truth. I mean, there is a difference between being elite and not being elite. Absolutely. And, no, you answered that perfect because uh, that, was, that was pretty much the whole point behind the question is having firefighters that show up prepared mentally, physically, and they, they generally know their job. Um, you know, at least what I've found in, in times past is that people, they might show up and say, well, I didn't do that because it's not my job to worry about it. But it is our job. We have to worry about everything. So, Well, I got to cut in real quick. You gotta, I got to do have to say this. And, and anybody that's listening, you're fooling yourself if you think everybody's created equal on a fire ground. And the people that like the job the most are the ones that are good at it. So you want to enjoy the job. You want to get the most out of the job. You got to be good at it. And when you go to a working fire and the chief passes you up for the next company and he's looking around and he goes and picks somebody that's five people behind you, then don't get pissed off. Be that person that's behind him. Because I'm going to tell you right now, and I took it from mentors that taught me, not everybody's created equal in the fire ground. When I have a specific cast, I'm looking for a specific person. And I'm going to say that one time and I'll shut up. When I need a specific <laughs> tactic or task done, I'm looking for a specific person and it's in my head. And hopefully they're working that night when the job happens. Absolutely. And you know who that person is because of their performance, right? You've seen them perform, you know what their capabilities are. No, uh, guarantee. You know, no, I, think, uh, I think everybody has niches too. I mean, you know, you don't, some guys are, are gravitate towards, you know, certain tasks and, and truck work or search or whatever it is. I mean, if you got a guy that he's jam up like, you know, force blunt through the lock, whatever, and I need to get in this building, I need to get in quick. I'm not going to send a guy that, you know, maybe is is really solid with, with you know, hose line management, but he hadn't forced the door in a year, you know what I'm saying? So there's, I think there's a lot to be said for that too, is having, you know, finding those guys those, that, are, that kind of find their niche, their, their special, you know, specialty in the field. And if you have those on your fire ground, you know, you know, use those guys to your advantage. If you have guys that are really good at certain tactics, you know, uh, everybody's got to understand that, you know, like you said, we're not, we're not, there's no way you can be a master at everything. There's not. And, and that's one of the challenges we face, right? On the suburban fire ground is, you know, I show up on an engine, but I might be going to the roof to do vertical vent. You know, I show up on an engine and, you know, one, and we had a fire a while back where we had a crew come in, lay a supply line, go to the roof, vent the roof, come down and pull a second line and go in and assist attack all in the same, in the same fire. 
So, you know, that's the, that's the one thing about the, you know, us versus maybe our urban brethren who have specialized tasks that, you know, that ride dedicated trucks, that ride dedicated engines, things like that. We have to kind of be able to adapt and on the fly because you may think you're coming in to do attack and end up on search or end up on, you know, ventilation or whatever the case may be because, you know, someone was out of pocket or, you know, whatever the conditions were dictated you changing kind of midstream. So uh, we do kind of have to be in a sense, jack of all trades, but I think the guys that really excel are the ones who find, you know, be, be generally good at everything, but find that one or two things they really are passionate about and really get good at it. Good point. Good point. You know, uh, to... go ahead. Go ahead I was just, I was just going to ask chief stone if he had anything to throw in on that real quick. To answer your original question, it's yes, and yes to, yes, we have to, we should expect our people to uh, do what you're talking about. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's an experience-driven occupation. A guy at one year, you know, you're going to train them and teach them a different way, and a guy at five years hopefully is going to be uh, five years ahead. Uh, but, you, but you know that's our ultimate goal, right? You know, one of the most demoralizing things in the fire service is uh, for firefighters is feeling like if they make a decision that they're going to uh, get jacked up over the decision. Right. You know, I tell guys all the time, I want you to make decisions on the fire ground, uh, but the decisions have to be based on a thought process. And if you think about it, it really makes sense because most of what we do is common sense. Like, okay, I'm going to do that because of this. Okay, well, that kind of makes sense. But if you make a decision just on an arbitrary process because, you know, there's no thought behind it, that's when we tend to do uh, more dangerous things. And the thing is, is if we don't do that with firefighters, we don't teach them that, we don't hopefully train them to the next level to start thinking like we're thinking. Um, then don't expect them to perform well when they have to make those decisions because I've gotten into conversations with you and said, well, firefighters aren't going to be making those decisions. The officers are going to be making the decisions. And all I tell them, I said, well, it's either one or two things. Either A, you know, uh, you haven't been doing this job that long or B, you don't go to fires because firefighters have to make decisions without their officer present. And we're failing them if we're not doing exactly what you're talking about. Now, to expect the two-year guy to make the same decisions as an eight-year guy is unrealistic. Uh, sure. But to understand the importance of building in that, that progressive fashion, especially in suburban America, you think about it, right? We're doing a lot of just what Nick said and everybody's saying. We're doing multiple tasks. It's, again, I would argue the fact that, that maybe it's, it's more important for us to train that much more diligently because we're, we're dealing with time-delayed tactics. We're dealing with limited staffing. We're dealing with less fires, quite honestly. In, in a lot of places, we don't go to as many fires as, as our urban counterparts. So we could argue that works against us. Um, so sure. yeah, to, to, to put it in a nutshell, to answer your question, yes, we absolutely should. And if fire departments aren't doing it, and a lot of them don't, and a lot of officers don't, uh, then we're really, really missing, missing the boat on that. You know? But it falls back on us and you guys too, because all of us at different levels have the influence and have the ability to 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 make that happen at certain levels right absolutely great point thank you chief we're like swiss army knives on on four wheels yeah so we, that's where we have to be today uh, and it really hasn't changed i mean I'll, I'll go back to my time way back in the 70s and early 80s it's no different as a volunteer especially my first department you couldn't even ride until you knew that truck cold and we had to know where everything was how to use every tool on that on that apparatus before you could get a seat on that apparatus. And then once you did, you were, you could go on the calls, but you still, even then, back then you had to make some decisions on your own to what to do. Cause it may, maybe you only had was the four of you on that first engine. Cause we got out fast and waiting for the rest of the volunteers to show up. You have to work. You have to do the work. You can't tell the people, well, it'll burn a little bit more, but we'll have it out soon. Mm -hmm. That's not going to fly. And, you know, a good friend of ours, uh, uh, John Haywick, Captain John Haywick, soon to be Battalion Chief John Haywick, up in uh, suburban Jersey, uh, told me the story a couple of years ago at the Great Florida Fire School that he, just before uh, the, uh, that summer, he was the acting BC and they came upon a strip, strip mall fire. And all they could see was a little flame inside a restaurant right, by, uh, right where the fryer was. They could see it there and they could see the hood. But he said he took his two best truckies and put them on the roof. He said, I want you to cut me three trenches, one at the front, give me 30 feet in the middle, and then give me to the other side. And each time they opened up a piece, they said, we got fire chief. Okay, go to the next one. We got fire chief, third one. We got fire chief. He says, okay, get the hell off the roof. And then, we, and then they started. Out of nine stores, they saved, I think it was six out of the nine with no damage other than a little bit of smoke. 
but he felt that he didn't, he didn't, hadn't done a good job. And I said, you kidding? You, you saved six stores in a strip center. How many people can put that on their record that they can do that? And you did the right thing that anybody else would have done. You checked out where the fire was before you decide to just go through, through the front door and, and make an attack on the fryer. We have to know when to say what, how, and when, whether you're a second year, five year, you're a captain or a chief. You have to, we have to be able to adapt and overcome right on the scene. Absolutely, Steve. Thank you for that too. Cause that, I mean, that, that kind of ties into one of the next topics that I know we want to discuss. Um, and Chief Isaacson's really good at this. He talks about it a lot. Um, so if he wants to lead off with that, I'll let him do that. Um, tactics. Tactics is what, what puts out fires. So do you want to expand on that for us, Chief? Or um, do you want to touch on time delayed tactics before we move on? Well, um, I mean, it kind of both go hand in hand. You know, it, the time delay tactics is really just trying to get people to focus that we can't do promotional tactics on the fire ground uh, when we don't have you know, textbook staffing. And, and that's, you know, something I look for in the future to try to, to maybe push out is that, mo and there's nothing wrong with this. I'm not knocking the textbooks, but, you know, I, I've lived my entire fire service career studying urban chiefs like Chief Vincent Dunn, and textbooks are written around uh, urban tactics. Behind Chief Stone, it looks like it's the Chief Clark book, the blue book, um, over his chair. If you see the blue book, I think pretty sure that's Chief Clark's book back there. And that's probably one of the best books in the fire service that's not even used anymore. That right there is probably, I've read that book cover to cover so many times, I can't even explain it. And it talks about one person per 50 GPM flow. In suburban America, we all know that Ninja Company Operations will pin a, a two and a half down and do an inch and eight to 265 or, you know, an inch and a quarter at 325 or we can get you know real in the weeds and do some dentist shit where we do stuff in the middle. But <laughs> the reality is, that our textbooks are written just like Chief Clark's book. And that's good. And that's, that's what we want to achieve once we have the density, the population, and the ability via Avalorum tax or whatever, you know, to get there. But until we get there, we have to be realistic. We can't pull up on a fire and say, engine one's attack, engine two supply, you know, truck one's ventilation, rescue one search. That's not reality. And I do think that we've come a long ways in recent years that we understand in suburban America that water application is gonna probably save more lives than all the truck tactics we're ever gonna do. In suburban America, don't misread me. Um, and I'm gonna get ahead of myself. I will tell you there's two things I did wanna to say tonight that I think the biggest evolution of suburban America is embracing VES and embracing big water. And when I mean big water, not necessarily always big water, but smooth bores, low pressure, high volume, you know, 150 at 50 or whatever. I think water application by the suburban firefighter. And I think us getting convincing our older chiefs that VES is not an FDNY tactic is taking us into the future, you know, big time. Um, but when we fall back on time delay tactics, suburban, you know, fire attack tactics, we need to understand that we, we're not doing check in a box. We're already promoted or, or either you're acting. So when you pull up, you're not trying to check off some check off sheet. What you're trying to do is, is say, what do I have and how many people do I have and what's realistic to get done? And it may be that one person on a two and a half using stream reach to knock down a garage while, you know, literally, I'll say it, the driver and the officer go do a VES and the pump's running itself. That's not ideal, but I'm going to take a chance that the pump's going to do its job over letting somebody die. And that, you know, that that's a hard thing as a whole to do um, that we have to do. But we fall back to, once again, your question on, you know, expectations and making sure everybody knows their job. And I did want to throw this in there before I pass the, the, the time here is we don't talk about this enough. We always talk about, you know, urban firefighters, big city firefighters have a specific task. And in recent time, I've been thinking about this a lot. Urban firefighters are no different than suburban firefighters or urban fire departments are no different than suburban fire departments. In urban fire departments, you have the ones that are into the job. We'll go back to saying, you know, Larry. Larry knows how to advance a hose line. Larry knows how to pump a rig. Larry probably, you know, knows more than people realize he does about water flow and tips, even though he works on a squad. And any other instructor that teaches and travels, 
you know, I kid around about Champo and I'll post pictures just making fun. You know, when we, when we do suburban fire training, Champo knows mo more than most, you know, guys that teach on the network that claim to be engine people. You know what I mean? It's, that's just not what his claim to fame is, but you know, he's no different than you or Nick at, at the end of the day, when you go to work, you're into the job, you love it. You want to know how to force a door. You don't want to stretch a line. You want to, to do all of it. So, um, you know, Yes, time delay tactics in suburban America is critical, but whether it's suburban or urban, we need more firefighters to be in the job because they're the ones that are going to get it done, whether it's rural, suburban, or urban. It really, you know, time delay tactics happens even in the urban setting as a whole when they pull up and it's, you know, it's go time, you know, to do it. You know, you go back to 20 years ago when Squad 4 pulled up on the, the crane with the, the trap guy over the, the huge fire. And why did Matt Mosley go up and hang from the helicopter? Because he was the first person wearing his harness. Well, that happens in every fire department in the country. Who's got their harness on? The one that's the most confident that, that knows that, that they want to be in on the action. Yep. Very well said. Chief Stone, you got anything? Regarding tactics in general in suburban America? Yeah, just uh, on, on uh, expanding on what Chief Isaacson said or anything um, – on time delayed tactics or how tactics put out fires, uh, expectations on that end, or, or what your your thoughts are on it? Well, I, I, yes, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything. I'll put it even probably in a more basic sense, just based on my experience, just good, solid, basic tactics. And I'll use an example, putting water on the fire. I can't tell you how many fires I've been to where that first line of getting water on the fire, and I, I'll preface it with, my previous job, I worked in a very fractured system. So the quality control from one department and one jurisdiction varied, you know, based on philosophies and cultures, you know, some really good, some, you know, less, less than good. Uh, so you'd see kind of a wide range of performance sometimes, but something as basic as understanding uh, the advancing of a line and putting the water in the right place. I mean, advancing line and open line is one thing, but actually putting the water in the correct place to support what, the main function is an aggressive primary search is, is instrumental in doing that. And then even in suburban America, I think the tactics, they're not more complex, but you could probably argue from an instant command point, they may be a little bit more complex because we don't, we're not double house, you know? So making that decision as an example, does the backup line take priority over the primary search? People immediately be like, are you kidding me? You're actually going to talk about that? No, in suburban America, the, the primary search has started nine times out of 10 by the first line that's advancing in. Yep. So depending on the fire volume, depending on the location, depending on the complexity of the stretch and depending on the intel that you get, uh, it could lead to a tough decision on whether or not you're going to stretch a second line to put more water in the fire to do exactly what Kurt said, which was, you know, to control the situation or putting them on an aggressive primary search and then lead you into the next question as to where are they going in the hose line? Are they searching remotely? Is it a VES? Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to get at the takeaway on all of these is, is they're all very basic functions that go back to repetition, go back to expectations and preparation. So you can talk about them all day long, but if you don't have that culture or certainly you know, like in, in Kurt's position and my previous position as a battalion chief, you don't have those expectations for your people and hold them to those expectations by coaching, mentoring, and putting and, and preparing them. I'm not talking about reprimanding them, writing them up. Then it's very predictable on how we're going to perform on the fire ground. So I'll, I'll just leave with this. Tactics in suburban America, I think, can be pretty dynamic because of the fact that you're usually making a, a, a call based on your resources and where they're at and it's usually limited, they're not double housed. And then those successes are based on how good the guys are at just doing solid, basic functions. You know? Absolutely, I, and I couldn't agree more. And I'll throw this out there and then I'll let whoever wants to interject. But I think what we're all trying to get at too in a roundabout way is when we show up, our conditions are gonna drive our tactics. And you gotta be able to know which tactic is most beneficial at that moment, giving the staffing level you have with the training that you have. All right. Um, I think that's where a lot of confusion comes in with people is they get overwhelmed really easy because either a, they haven't trained, um, trained with their staffing levels, I should say, um, you know, they say, Oh, we can't search because of the two in two out thing. Um, all of these things come into play and 
hey, you know, we could debate stuff all day long. Me personally, I'm going to choose what best fits the situation I'm in. So, you know, um, if I have a VS situation and we're only riding two, cause that's, Hey, that's suburban life for us. And we got to go. Maybe it's better that I take a hose line and I support that surf search effort with water application. You know, mm -hmm. who's saying that you can't do that. Um, and I think that's where we try to get off a little bit is we tend to think of those things as very separate things that have to happen on the fire ground, separate tasks by separate crews. And uh, that, that's just not the case. Uh, it's no different than searching off the hand line. You know, you only need one person to put the fire out. So if we go in with a crew of two, I got my nozzle man suppressing the fire. Well, I could search those immediate rooms right behind me, can I? So we're doing two things, primary search and fire attack simultaneously. And I think that's where um, we are successful on the fire ground is when we can understand the tactics we have or the conditions we have and choose those tactics most appropriately. So uh, I'll add this, just food for thought. Uh, yeah, I think you're spot on, you know, and I think the biggest, uh, I don't want to say gap in the fire service, but probably one of the biggest areas that helps either facilitate what you're talking about, or actually goes the opposite direction of, you know, being policy driven, like what's two in and two out, you know, we can't do it, is the position that I'm in now. So I, I've said this a couple of times over the last nine months in my new position, is that I've talked the talk for a long time of what I think you know, chiefs that control operations and fire departments should do. And I'm sitting in the seat now, and now it's my responsibility to do, to ensure the things that we're talking about today uh, become a reality. I shouldn't say become a reality, build upon the, the organization that I'm at and, and to take it to the next level so that that mindset and that culture uh, becomes more of a reality each year as we build it. Because at, at your level, at a company officer level, a firefighter level, you can do that independently and kind of like small groups and districts. Uh, but certainly as you go up each level, at a battalion level, they can do it within a battalion. But how many times have you seen like the other two battalions that just don't operate that way? What's well, the philosophy of this one, Chief? And the next level up at the operations, you look at the really aggressive fire departments that tend to be more successful and to take a look at their upper ranks. They're experience driven, they study the job, high expectations, position of people to succeed. You know, and we're missing that in the fire service collectively across the board. I'll just say it, we really are, unfortunately. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't see some of the same stuff that we can measure statistically across the board, such as firefighter deaths, line of duty deaths. Maintain 100 since, what, the mid-70s? Right. That's right. a problem. That's a big, big deal, you know. So anyhow. Absolutely. No. And absolutely. you mentioned a word before, you, which was the key word. Both of you have said it, which is mentoring. Mentoring is the key to improving the fire service. We have to have the people with experience willing to share their knowledge. I've been an educator all my life. And you have to be willing to share your knowledge with those coming up to bring them to that level that you're seeking. You can't just expect them to show it to them once and they understand it. And then you, three days later, you have a call that that tactic is needed and they really don't remember anything from three days before. Mentoring is the key for us to improve the fire service, both suburban, urban, volunteer career, it makes no difference. If we don't take care of the people and help them learn and grow, just like a teacher does in the classroom with our kids who go to school, we know that our kids come home, some of our kids come home with great grades in certain subjects. And when you go to the PTA meeting and you meet that teacher, you can see how involved that teacher is and how much he or she cares about their kids. On the other hand, there are other teachers who come and teach for a paycheck. That's all they, that's what they're there for, just for a paycheck. Well, we have great leaders like the two of you and, and Nick and, and Sean and many others who are seeing that key factor of mentoring is what's going to help us grow, nurture, nurture first and grow uh, the fire service, those coming in behind us. Absolutely. I was going to add something real quick on like, it's, you know, it seems like the listener always wants like something, a phrase or whatever. <laughs> so it, it's just, it's the, today's, it's like acronyms. Suburban fire tactics demand efficient and effective tactics to make up for lost time. And it kind of goes with what Shannon was saying is that, you know, in the first question, we as suburban firefighters have to have efficient and effective tactics because we have to make up for lost time because our time distance travel 
on our firehouses are not a city where it's five blocks down the street to the next firehouse. And Shannon said it, we're not rolling out with a double, an engine and a truck. We're rolling out with an engine with two, three, maybe four on it. And now we're six miles. I know Midway, 35 and 37, they're six miles apart. If there's a fire across the street, you know, I know that like, you know, like 37 is not going to get down to College Parkway. It could, it's probably going to be over 15 minutes with this, the bridge, bridge debacle. And so now Shannon's guys coming out of 35, they better be efficient and effective as they can to make up for lost time that nobody's going to be there for 15 minutes. That's what it really is all about. And that's where there is no, there's no margin for ever, you know, for error. There's no margin for, you know, mistakes or delays. So I think that's kind of the, the big factor there on the, the, the key question. Real so Chief, <laughs> Chief, that I couldn't say any better myself. And um, I know Nick has something he wants to bring up real quick, but before we do, one of the things that I teach when I teach my search class is I ask the students to, to think of three distinct questions and it goes hand in hand and um, pretty much exactly everything you just said is three, three things, time, ability, and knowledge. Those are three things we gotta ask. So we have an incident, someone called 911, you have dispatch time, um, you know, you have the time it takes you to arrive, the time it takes you to gather your thoughts, do your 360, put your first things into action, all of that stuff is time. So it matters how quickly you stretch line. It matters how quickly you mask up, how you throw ladders, all of that stuff. Those seconds add to minutes and those aren't ours to be wasting on the fire ground. Um, the second is ability. If you're not out there training, right, you don't truly know what you're able to do. So when that call comes in, now that we take time as a factor and you add ability, if you're not uh, being effective, <clears throat> with how you choose to stretch that line to the fire or how you choose to enter your building or throw that ladder, whatever the situation is, you're really not doing anybody any good because you're just wasting more time. And then the third thing with being knowledge is how much do you truly know about what's being asked of you, right? Just because you, you work for a fire department, you show up on scene and, and you're there, doesn't mean that you're making things better. If you, if you don't have the knowledge, right, and the, the ability to perform, you're really not doing anything at all. Um, you know, <laughs> almost a, a well-dressed civilian could probably do more than you can at that point. So uh, those are my three things that I think tie in exactly what you were saying that that's very important that, that we get right. Absolutely, Sean. I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we talk about guys being force multipliers and all that stuff, and that's a common, you know, uh, term that gets thrown around in the, in the fire service. But there's a lot to be said for that. You know, uh, Kurt, you were talking about uh, some of, you know, the 35 guys waiting on, on the backup, you know, not having guys uh, right behind them. You know, you get something off college, you know, college uh, parkway right there or whatever. They're going to have to be Johnny in the spot. They got four-man crew, maybe a five-man crew, and they're going to have to – basically handle their, their business. Um, and there isn't really a lot of room for error. Um, and they have to understand that, you know, their, their second due is, you know, five, 10 minutes behind them in some cases, right. You know, that fire that uh, Shannon mentioned earlier uh, about, uh, you know, when we were on the beach, we're on, the, we're on a working fire, uh, pretty much the entire South end was gone. The first due engine was well over 15 minutes out. Uh, on that townhouse fire so that are you know that that is one of the things that I feel like you know in, in the suburban fire service uh, we don't have the luxury of numbers sometimes we have to kind of maximize the people that we do have and part, a lot of that starts with mindset a lot of that starts with culture and training and you know in the firehouse before the tones even go off and you know I always tell you know people uh, being aggressive is is not any one specific thing task whatever it, it's it's a it's a operating position it's a mindset and you know um it, it gets thrown around a lot people you know some people make it sound like a bad thing like it's you know a stigma that oh the cowboys rose whatever you want to you know they'll throw those terms out there but at the end of the day you know if my house is burning and my kids are in there you know who do i want coming right i want the guy who's going to lay it all on the line who's been training every shift who's been reading the trade you know magazines learning as much as he can um, and, and I want, I want the, you know, the guy that's going to lay it all out there for my, for my family. And, you know, when we go to work every day, we have to ask ourselves those questions. Like, you know, if, if your family 
you know, has to call 911 in five minutes and you're responding to their emergency. I think, uh, Chief Stone, you talk about, you know, uh, you know, kind of measuring yourself by your children's standards. Um, there's a lot to be said for that. And, you know, um, tactics at the end of the day are driven, uh, you know, a lot of it is what we make of it. A lot of it is what we make of it. And yes, sometimes we have to do unconventional tactics, you know, whether it's, you know, having a driver pack up and take a hose line, put a hose line in the garage while the crews are stretching a line to, you know, to the front door or, you know, searching off hand lines routinely, uh, maybe not taking command, you know, passing command to a second unit because, Hey, we're all hands on deck here. We got, you know, people trapped. We got, uh, you know, fire conditions that warrant everybody's working. And uh, while that may not be by the textbook, like chief Ike was saying, you know, that's what we, we have to make those decisions and we have to be, you know, well-trained enough and, and, and confident enough that um, we can take what we do have and get the job done. And uh, with that, I think this is a good place to maybe take a, a quick break. Um, and, uh, but when we come back, you know, I'd like to, you know, maybe sit down and talk about specific tactics um, that uh, are effective in the suburban, on the suburban fire ground, uh, maybe discuss some tips for improving efficiency and effectiveness uh, on the fire ground, and then, uh, you know, maybe we can dive into a little bit of culture talk and building that foundation in the firehouse. Sounds like a plan. So, folks, we're going to take a quick break. For those of you watching the video, you'll never know anything happened. Those of you in the audio, we'll be right back right after these words. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force. Of course, if you're watching the video, nothing happened, right? And if you're listening to the audio, we're glad to have you back with my cohorts in uh, fire crime here. Uh, Captain Nick Peppard and uh, Sean Duffy of Build Your Culture and their guests, Chief uh, uh, Kurt Isaacson and Chief Shannon Stone. And Nick, we'll get, throw it back to you and let's continue for the next part of the show. All right. Uh, so uh, one of the things we were talking about at the break was just kind of getting into tactics and, and mindset and how we, you know, set ourselves up for success. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, maybe it's like you said, it's not by the book. It's not, you know, if approved or whatever, um, but quite frankly, it works. And, you know, some of the things I think about, like just in the suburban uh, uh, area that, that I think is, you know, over the last 10, 15 years that has progressed. And, um, you know, Chief, you talk, Chief Ike, you talked about BES, um, crews being not afraid to search, you know, without a hand line. Um, that's been a big you know, a big progression in the suburban fire service over the last 15 years. Uh, another thing that I can think of right off the top of my head that I know that uh, we do routinely, and I, I'm pretty sure most of, uh, most of Northwest Florida to some degree uses this tactic is booster backup uh, straight in, whatever you want to call it. But we, you know, instead of the second dude catching the plug every time, you know, we're bringing that engine in, giving, you know, quick water manpower, front loading our resources so that we can get the most out of them. You know, if we're showing up and we got, you know, two, three man engine companies and, and that's it for the next couple minutes. You know, if I get 2000 gallons of water, and six guys that know what they're doing, go to work, we can get a lot done with those six guys. So uh, booster backup, you know, searching off hand lines. We talked about that, you know, initiating primary search off, off a hand line, um, you know, had a fire about a year ago. Uh, and this wasn't, you know, human, human casualties or, or victims, but we had a couple of pets that were lost. And as an engine crew, you know, we're first on scene for a couple of minutes. Our second do was about three minutes out. We initiated, you know, you know, made the door, got in there, used the tick, found the fire, started hitting the fire, and uh, initiated, you know, initiated primary search off the uh, hand line. Found the first dog, pulled him out, went back inside, and we had searched over fifty percent of the structure before the second engine made entry to begin primary search. So, you know, while that may not be conventional for some, I think that uh, it definitely works. Um, and, and, you know. Uh, those are some of the tactics just off the top of my head. Like I said, that, you know, even when I came on the job 15 years ago that, you know, uh, I, I wasn't taught coming out of Academy searching off a hand line. I wasn't taught booster backup. You know, we were always told second dude catches a plug, you know, that's, that's just the way it is. And, you know, uh, VES was not something we did in fire Academy 15 years ago that, you know, that, well, that was a no, no, <laughs> those guys were crazy. Um, but, but those tactics again, uh, they work, whether it's in the urban setting or the suburban setting or the rural setting, um, you know, those, you know, maybe they have to be modified and adapted a little bit because of our staffing. But if we know what we're doing, we're well-trained and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're operating uh, uh, within our, within our, 
you know, abilities, um, I think that we can be very successful using less than ideal tactics, you know, um, uh, not taking command. Like I said, you know, guys going, going to work, um, yes, we're on the, you know, I show up on the first officer and we may have, you know, kind of a mobile command, but at the end of the day, if I'm going into do VES with my, with, with a firefighter or I'm doing fire attack, how, how well am I really running command? Right. So, Hey, I'm going to, I'm passing command to my second arriving unit. So, um, those are just some things like, you know, just in my personal experience that I've seen that have been very effective that work that maybe don't fit the textbook criteria, but I definitely would love, I'd love to hear, uh, you know, chief Fike, if you want to chime in and, uh, kind of your thoughts on, on some of those tactics and, and maybe some tactics that, uh, you have utilized in your career that aren't exactly by the book, but that work really, really well. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> I'll try to keep it to just two, two minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'm so passionate about booster backup. There are people dead. There are civilians that died in a private dwelling that could have lived if the department allowed the second degree to come straight to the scene. That's just a factual statement. I mean, that's just, you know, it's my opinion, but I think it's factual. I think the number one thing that we can do to, um, make up for lost time, that, that statement I said earlier, is in suburban America, because it is a suburban America tactic. I, I want to do clarify that, or I, I like to call it county fire tactic, because county has rural, suburban, and urban using suburban staffing. But I, I truly 100% think the number one thing we can do to give a trapped civilian a fighting chance is to boost their backup. Um, it gives us, um, you know, most of the time enough people to – safely attack a fireman that's mean safely i don't mean just for them safely you know you know for or for us i mean for them so you know I, that that in itself is just a topic that i i think we're up against the same thing we were up with ves uh you talk about tactical fire ground command presence is one of our topics before we close out is if 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 we can find a way to get people like chief stone that he's already into it but like people in his position ops chiefs that grew up under IFSTA where the second do rig caught a hydrant to just sit and talk about the second do rig coming straight in and third do for supply. I think we'll make huge progress on civilian grabs and property conservation because it's going to be property too. Um, you know, I'll say this since chief stones on here and, you know, midway's near and dear to my heart is there was a fire chief before chief Kanzig that they had to catch a hydrant no matter what. They had to have everybody on the fire ground and they had to have everything set up before they could go. And as soon as Chief Kanzik, you know, became the fire chief and he came from the city of Mobile and urban fire department, they became instantaneously, it happened within a week, they were allowed to, to basically the second rig come in. They were allowed to deploy as people arrived like they did in Mobile where he was from. The fire ground was decades ahead within a matter of just a leadership change. And this isn't to blow smoke up Chief Kanzig's you know, thing, but that's what we have to do. We have to get to chiefs of operations and fire chiefs in suburban and county fire departments to understand why we're asking to deviate from foundational tactics that have been around for decades when we're not rolling out with an engine and a truck. And I could keep going on, but I'm going to leave it there. And, you know, Chief Stone's, you know, equally passionate about it. You know, he just doesn't spit on the screen like I do. <laughs> Chief Stone, you want to throw some thoughts on that, on yeah, that topic? So my like uh, specific tactics regarding suburban America. So I was just sitting here thinking, and I can tell you, like, uh, I would say in in my my career, twenty five years in the city of Fulham Beach, and then and another four right there in South Okaloosa County. The two single tactics, in my opinion, that have been game changers. Aside from the booster tank backup, we started doing it about 10 years ago. We followed Kirk's lead in Escambia, and it was just an absolute no-brainer that I find uh, amazing. There's even debate over it uh, on the applications where we, where we use it. Uh, but aside from that, the two, the two tactics that I think suburban America made the biggest difference in my experiences is one, VES, when I came through the fire academy in 1989, got on the job in 1990, you're right. They, they weren't doing it. We weren't doing it in, in Northwest Florida. I can tell you that for a fact, yeah. um, you know, and as we learned it, you know, we didn't know, we didn't know until we got outside of our bubble, you know, and Kurt and I, we, we grew up in the fire service together. You know, we bounced 
we've been bouncing stuff off each other for 30 years now, you know, and, uh, and as we've learned these different ways through other parts of the country and urban America, the things that work, we've applied them here as a lot of guys in this area have, uh, and, and you've seen the results. So VES, I've, I've seen countless uh, saves, you know, and, and in the city of Fall and Beach and the surrounding areas of VES over the years, countless saves. They weren't happening prior to VES. But the other one that's really just kind of developed into a, a really good, I think, aggressive suburban tactic just in the last decade, for us in Full Walton, it's been a little bit longer. It's been about probably 15, 18 years is the engine search. And again, it's one of these common sense things. Like if you're not double housed, uh, you know, and you're the first engine in and you've you've got a delay of a few minutes, you know, we we're fortunate in Full Walton, we had four companies on top of us within two to three minutes, but it did not change the fact that there was still that one to two minute delay of a search happening. But teaching the engine search, which Kurt and I, we teach this, you know, in, in the, the engine company classes, uh, is searching from the door in and from the nozzle back. And it's based on experience, it's based on expectations, and it's based on repetitions and just practicing and getting good at it. Again, the engine search, I've seen more people pulled out of houses from the engine search and the VES and suburban America. And how do I measure that? Because we weren't doing it before and we weren't pulling people out. And you look at the last 15 years in my previous job, and it blows me away how many, let's just say the last 10, it blows me away on how many grabs have been made in the last decade, successful and non-successful, but, but we're actually, you know, pulling them out of the buildings. And you look at the previous 15 years, it's a crazy difference. It's, it's gotta be attributed to something. And in my opinion, VES, uh, training on VES and the aggressive engine search, supported by the other tactics have, have been a game changer in my experience in suburban America. So much so that when, you know, Kurt and I are teaching, I mean, we believe wholeheartedly and not, you know, because we've experienced it and we push it hard because it makes sense. Prove us wrong. <laughs> That's kind of the way I look at it. Show us how we're wrong on this one, you know? Look at the numbers. Pull the yeah. numbers up. You know, where, where are victims being found? Uh, you know, there's a lot of data that's been compiled over the last five, six years in the fire service uh, of where we're finding victims, you know, who's finding the victims, all that information, it's, it's freely available now, thanks to, you know, social media, thanks to technology. And it's amazing that we, you know, the fire, I say we, the fire service is so stuck on certain things because that's just the way, you know, that's the way we're taught when we came on the job, right? We get so stuck on those things that, you know, at the end of the day, if the numbers don't lie, the numbers don't lie, the data doesn't lie. And, you know, look and see where we're being successful, look and see where we're failing. And to me, you got to, you know, you've got to adjust tactics to meet, to meet that, to, to, to understand that, Hey, you know, if 26% of victims are found in the egress path, well, guess where the engine's typically going? They're going right down that heart, the heart of that building to the fire. Right. Um, you know, that's, that's important information, right? How many, how many victims, uh, you know, I think it goes back to being educated, you know, well-trained and understanding you know, time of day where we're going to typically find victims and making an informed search instead of this, you know, we're just going to do a left-hand search because that's what we are taught in fire Academy. Right. So we go and we go left. Why, you know, why am I going to go left? If left takes me into a, a garage or a living room, it's two in the morning. Where, where are the bedrooms? Where's the egress path? So, you know, and that's, that's the thing that I think that, you know, I, I look in just my short career, you know, in the last 15 years that's been pushed and you look at all these grabs that are being made is because I think guys are starting to, actually take the numbers, study those numbers, apply those numbers, apply their tactics to, to meet, uh, you know, that, that information. And that's why we're, we're starting to be more successful. Um, and, and that's just, like I said, my, my personal experience on it, but you know, you're right, chief. I mean, it really, you know, if, if you got a, in 25 years, you know, for 15 years, you're not pulling people out of buildings and all of a sudden in the last 10 years, you're, uh, I can think of three grabs in Fort Walton beach alone, in the last 10 years that have been, you know, attributed to VES, right? Just in the city of Fort Walton Beach. I mean, countless Escambia, I mean, across the panhandle, there's been success stories like that. And, and you got to ask yourself, why? Why? You know, what's changed other than some training and maybe modifying our tactics a little bit? Um, I think, the, you know, the proof's in the pudding, so to speak. Hey, real so, quick, um, I just think, you know, based on what you're talking about, you got to give a shout out to firefighterrescuesurvey.com and I think we every podcast every instructor that teaches 
around the country needs to get more people aware of firefighterrescuesurvey.com. Um, you know, numerous individuals were involved in making that happen. And anybody that's listening to this podcast, when you see those charts, whether Brian Olson does it or whoever, when you see instructors and they build their slide and they have these percentages, they're coming from firefighterrescuesurvey.com. And that's just another thing that shows that the, the new fire service is not all that bad. There are things that we have people doing in this occupation that we didn't do 20 or 30 years ago, and that's one of them. And so just a shout out, you know, if you're not familiar with it, just go look it up, firefightersurvey.com. That information is helping instructors, you know, whether it's Sean or, or Nick or, or whoever's teaching a search class or even me teaching a command class. Those are, are real numbers that we were not getting in nippers when we do our firehouse reporting stuff. So um, hopefully y'all can just add that into the podcast. I think that's, that's well worth a shout out. And I'll put that, yeah, on, absolutely. Website, I'll put that on our website as well. We have oh, absolutely. Page, Chief. Links, I, right? I appreciate you bring that up because it is important to know. And, and we tend to focus on that too for success, but it's also important to know where we're not successful. And that's exactly what firefighter rescue survey uh, does for us. It, it shows us the numbers. Uh, granted, it's 1,172 documented surveys, and yes, it is voluntary, but you know, some data is better than no data, and uh, I'll go with those numbers, and mm -hmm. at the, more, the more and more we go on, you know, those numbers show by doing things like VES or getting the first hand line to the seat of the fire promptly and, you know, targeting your search, doing all those things. We are, we are successful, and to go back with Chief Stone was talking about VES. If you look at those same very number or those same numbers, what you're going to find is since they've been documented, 133 uh, documented rescues from VES alone have been made. And the percentage of those surviving has been 48%. So when you tell me that there's this tactic that I could use, that gives me a 50% chance of survival and yields a very high chance that we're going to find a victim. I think it's worth taking a look at, and that's what's going to make us successful on the fire ground. So sure. anyone who's not using these numbers or looking at them and keeping up to date, they're just, they're not doing everything they swore they would do. And, um, you know, I, I think that there's a time where we have to start implementing those. And even if we started implementing that into policy, you know, if we took that same stuff and we did something like that for us on the fire ground, we can look, take a look at ourselves, our own individual stats for our department based off our staffing levels and things like that. So um, I want to thank Chief Isaacson for bringing that up because it is such a great point and, and a very, very good tool to use. So I got a question. I mean, you know, uh, Chief Stone, if you want to jump in on this one, why do you think more chief officers, you know, you, most of the guys that are chief officers now, um, you know, came up through a lot of these changes, the VES, you know, the, the split searches, the target searches, uh, you know, quick water, booster backup, you know, you're getting a lot of, a lot of information out there nowadays. Um, so a lot of guys that are in those chiefs positions, you know, have been, you know, kind of come up through that, that environment. Why do you feel that a lot of chiefs are hesitant to sign off on uh, those tactical priorities, those tactical, you know, those tactics in general, um, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, make it a point to really push for training along those lines. Um, and, and I bring that up, you know, there's, there's whole departments that have been, you know, just, you know, with all the stuff that's come out with, uh, the NIST studies and, and UL and everything that jumped on the, you know, the transitional tact thing, you know, before all the information was out, but, you know, there's been policies made across the country, um, that, that, you know, seems counterintuitive at times, um. Why do you think that, you know, we're, we're, as a fire service, so many chiefs, you know, they get in those positions and uh, is it, is it the risk management mindset that's kind of creeped in to, you know, and kind of kept them from, uh, you know, maybe making um, those, I, you know, I, I hate to use the word aggressive, but, you know, making aggressive uh, tactical SOGs uh, the norm um, or, you know, is it something different? Is it, is it, you know, is it a mindset that you, you feel is, is driven by, you know, just fear of the unknown, or is it just, you know, is there something tactically that we're missing? I feel like, you know, you go to these, you go to conferences, you go to FDIC, and you get around brothers that are, that, that are passionate about the job. And it's a no brainer, man. Like put a line between the victims and the fire, you know, put, put the fire out, everything gets better. VES, um, you know, uh, vertical ventilation when it's worn, it, it works, you know, and there's so much misinformation that gets spread. 
And unfortunately, a lot of that comes, you know, from from guys at the chief level. Um, so as, as a chief, you know, the long roundabout way to get to the question is, um, what are your thoughts on that? And where, where does that mindset come from? Is it one of, of you know, overabundance of caution to avoid liability or, you know, are they just, they don't understand the tactic? That, my friend, is a loaded question. <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody has her probably has an opinion on it, you know, and, and I think there's, there's varying reasons. I'll, I, I, I'll give you a, a few of my observations. Um, one, yeah, uh, risk management, liability, it does. That's their job at the top. Sure. You know? And one thing, one thing I've learned over the last uh, 12, 13 years that I couldn't have tell, told you prior to that is there is a level of disconnect when you become a chief. And it starts at the battalion chief level. There really is, you know, and, I, and I'll tell you where it, where it became evident for me was uh, we, you know, I've worked in Escambia for years. I worked there from 97 until 04 as a fireman. Um, and then I went back in uh, 13 at about 2013 when I was about two and a half years into being a battalion chief. And when I went back to riding backwards on the rig and I went back to doing what firemen do, and that's riding backwards and going to fires, I realized quickly how I had slipped, unknowingly I had slipped further away from understanding and, and being close to what I needed to be close and that's what the firemen do on the rigs. I wasn't disconnected, but until I actually put myself in that position, it when I went back to Escambia and I worked over there regularly, just one of those guys that happened to be at the right spot every time I went to work, it seemed like I was going to a fire over there. Um, it, it, it heightened the importance of a lot of the things at the bottom level. I, I say that to say this. Each level you go up, there's a level of disconnect. And I think, I think if you don't, come up through the ranks, you don't value the things that we're talking about, and you don't make the extra effort to stay engaged, it's very predictable that when you get to that level at the top, there's going to be a level of disconnect that you're not going to quite get. It's kind of like you don't know what you don't know. There really is. And I think a big part of the answer to that is that you hire the right people. So a lot of departments don't necessarily have operations chiefs. And if they do, um, they're focused on everything else but operations. But I think if you take and you put that guy in there, that's their focus. I think you have a higher chance of, of staying on top of things. And the reality is the job is so fast moving and so changes so much. And it hasn't changed as far as the pace of it changing since the very beginning. The captain that I worked for for many years, David Messerschmitt, he was my battalion chief. He used to constantly tell us how quickly it was changing and how we had to study it. And he was so unbelievably right. You, you know, if you don't pay attention a year or two later, you know, what was the norm today is not going to be the norm um, in two years. Um, so that is such a loaded question. And there's so many opinions. Here's the last one I'll tell you. And this is the honest to God truth. Most of them are smart enough not to promote up. They are. I mean, when you, when you, when you get into a battalion level and then when you get above that, it's exhausting. You know, it, you, you constantly feel like, you know, that no matter how good you do, there's an element that, that, uh, that you're fighting against. You know, and it's not a bad thing. Like it, it, it can be a good thing. But the point being is that most of the guys are smart enough to realize the best spot in the firehouse is on the rig. The best spot is riding that right seat as a captain. And a lot of them, and I could give you examples of guys that said like, I ain't gonna do it, man. I ain't going out like that. I'm gonna stay where I'm enjoying it. It's just not worth it. And unfortunately we lose a lot of really good potential leaders that won't do it. And it goes back to what we said earlier. It really, it goes back to mentoring, preparing them. And then hopefully being within a culture that cultivates it and, and has them move up. But even Fort Walton, where I worked for many years and I'll never have anything bad to say about that organization. I grew up there. I think it's probably one of the best organizations in Florida. Uh, but it's hard to convince guys to move up because of the very things that we're, we're talking about, you know. So yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, man. It's kind of all over the place. I'm not saying anything that you probably haven't thought about or already talked about. Um, you know, if you think about it, if you think about it, the very chiefs that you may be thinking in your head, they're like, well, what the hell? How are you not getting it? When was the last time you saw one of them at a conference? When was the last nope. time all of them come and grab you and say, let's go out to training? When was the last time they were on the, on the drill ground with you looking and watching your company stretch a line? Or better yet, hey, let me see that second. Let me hold that nozzle. What are you talking about? And I'm not knocking them. It's just an observation. Yeah. You don't see them much, man. And, and, and various reasons, but, but you just don't, 
and, and that in itself creates a big disconnect, you know, that, that happens. So, well, you know, I want to do, I do want to add on a positive note for the listeners that the younger people that are so ate up with this job. And I wish, you know, I could have figured out earlier And Shannon knows this and definitely one of my lifelong best friends, Jonathan Kensick, it's Shannon's boss knows this. I'm very obnoxious when it comes to fire chiefs. Like, you know, I've been like, you know, just angry, I guess you could say towards them. But I can tell you, I'm, I'm focusing more and more just in the last year about being positive is being in our search and all the stuff we're talking about as crazy as it is, can be dictated the culture. And I know we're going to finish out with the culture, which, you know, Sean's in the culture is the fire chief's a powerful person. And I will say that I think more so in the last year locally, and I'm going to talk about chief Sealy who just left mobile and went over to Gulf shores. And I'm going to talk about chief Denny Craner that took over the Pensacola fire department a few years ago. And when I think of those two individuals and I know how those organizations operated not even back to the 90s, like 9-11 time frame, and what those two individuals allowed their people to do that were patient enough and waited, it's exciting. It really is. And it goes with what Rob Fisher from the, you know, fools that said 10 pounds of pressure 100% of the time is going to get a lot more than yelling and spitting and jumping in somebody's face. And if, if you really want it to happen, you're just going to have to be patient. You don't build culture overnight. You don't build culture in a year. And culture will – um, compensate for 1078 an hour. I've witnessed that personally. So when somebody makes 1078 an hour, they're liable to stay with you just because of the culture. So for the listener is, you know, you, you can't get angry at your fire chief. They just know what they know. They know what they've been in. And if they've been doing it for 20 or 25 years, you know, your best thing might just be hope and patience that when they leave, you're going to get a chief Jenny Craner. You're going to get a chief, you know, Sealy, and they're going to come in and I think once those chiefs come in, they're going to, even if they're only chief for a few years, the next person is going to follow exactly what they do because that's just inevitable how we pass down the fire service. So I really do think that whatever it's the booster backup, VES, engine company search, all of those things, I think our future fire chiefs are going to be more open and embrace it because there's just a shift of retirement that's happening and they're being outnumbered at chief conferences. And Shannon knows this. I'm not, I've never been a real positive person about fire chiefs going to meet somewhere in a city to go to dinner. But I do think I've been thinking more positively that they're starting to infiltrate each other. And the progressive chiefs, you know, are starting to share that stuff. And the other chiefs now they're hearing more of them saying it. So they don't want to be left out. So at the dinner table, the fire chiefs listen to the other fire chief. And so I think, you know, I'll leave it at this. The young firefighters should hold on for a greater fire service in suburban America. I really think suburban America is going to be the closest to embracing urban culture than we've ever seen in the history of suburban America. So it's just going to be, you're going to have to be patient. Yeah, that's, that's a, uh, honestly, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I was getting at. Um, at by, by no means am I trying to slam any, any chiefs. I, I'm not a chief. I've never been a chief. Um, so I don't pretend to understand the, the thought processes and the things that they have to deal with. Um, at that level. Um, I'm just, you know, it, it, it's always been curious to me, a lot of the guys, you know, promote up through the ranks and, you know, you work with them on the line and they're, you know, in the, the mindset seems to, you know, sometimes, you know, shift and, and rightfully so, you know, it's not, it's not just operation stuff we're dealing with on a daily basis, you know, chiefs are dealing with on a daily basis. There's a lot of political stuff that comes into play. There's a lot of, you know, but it's just interesting to see um, a lot of tactics that have been kind of, you know, push over the last 10, 15 years, um, you know, we're not always quick to, to jump on board. You know, there's still departments that, that won't allow guys to be, yes, there's still departments that say that, you know, you have to catch the hydrant, you know, every time. Um, and it's just, it's interesting to see that. And I, you know, I'm just, I guess I was more curious, like I said, just trying to where that, where that, you know, happens, where, where the mindset shift is, where, um, you know, they, and it's crazy because a lot of, you know, a lot of chiefs you sit down and talk with, they get it. They, they know what you're saying, but they're not, they don't want to pull the trigger or whatever, you know, for whatever reason to, to sign off on that tactic or whatever. Um, I do think, like you said, the more, you know, the constant steady pressure seems to be overall, uh, you know, cultures build over time and it does, you know, affect departments. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's it just, I, I think it's, it's, you know, we're always looking to, I don't know, it seems like the fire service is always looking for, 
you got two groups. You got the groups that, you know, are always looking for the next best thing. You know, they're always looking for the, the little gadget, the gizmo, the, you know, uh, the catchphrase. And then you got guys that, you know, maybe, you know, it takes a long time to convince them that, hey, maybe we need to change our tactics a little bit uh, because this is the way, you know, I've, I've done this, this works, I've done it for years. Um, so I think there's like a kind of a, almost a conflict between those two mindsets that takes place in the fire service. And, and unfortunately, the, the suburban fire service in particular seems to be torn in, in those directions. You know, like I said, you have one department down the road that, you know, is, is hit it hard from the yard, uh, to, you know, exterior water first 90% of the time. And then you got another department, you go to, you know, five minutes down the road and they're making interior attacks and, and you know, getting after it. And um, there's definitely, uh, you can see the, the, the culture contrast, I guess, uh, pretty dramatically in the suburban fire service in particular. Um, and that, that was what I was getting at. Definitely not a knock on the chiefs. I think that uh, there's a lot on their plates, especially uh, in limited staffing situations, limited uh, resources. Uh, but it is interesting to see that the, the trends, the shifts uh, across the country. And, uh, you know, uh, it just seems like it takes, it takes a long time for stuff to change, but then it really doesn't, you know, stuff changes and then it comes back around and, uh, there's a lot of, hey, you know, thing, the smooth bores, right? I, when I came on the first service, everybody's still all about fog nozzles. And now I, there's so many departments that have made a shift back to smooth bores because of lower pressures and higher GPMs and whatever. And, and, it's, and it's interesting to see that just stuff like that kind of come around. The search stuff, you know, we, we go from you got to have a hand line to search to almost nobody searching with hand lines now. Um, you know, so it's, it's just, it's just, I'm always intrigued by that, that, that cultural the cultural shifts and in, in, in the kind of full circle effect in a lot of ways that stuff that maybe worked 30 years ago. Oh, Hey, that's why they did this, right? There's a time and place for it. Um, but, you know, we talk about tactics, put out fires at the end of the day. Um, you know, I feel like we have to, we have to set ourselves up, you know, bottom line is you got to take the people that you got, the organization you have, and you got to you got to build your, your tactics around what you have, not what you don't have if that makes sense. It does. And you know, as the old saying goes, what are the two things that are the fire, fire service hates? Status quo and change. Right. Right. True. So, so, to, so to add one last thing, and, and the fire chief's uh, defense of suburban America, and I can certainly say this uh, in, in a handful of departments here where we work, Kurt and I have had many discussions about this, We've never walked in their footsteps. I will say that, and I, and, I, and I'll tell you that that like you know, uh, two chiefs I've worked with in the last ten years. The more I've been exposed to what they have to do, um, I'm not making excuses, but I understand how they get overwhelmed, and you only have so much time and so many things that you can do. So, you know, fortunately, I think here at Midway, uh, they identified that pretty quickly, which is why I was fortunate enough to get hired here because they identified that there's just too much that, that one person can do. And they wanted to put a support mechanism in their staff before they start rapidly expanding to hopefully uh, address the very issues that you're, that you're talking about. Uh, but the reality is, is that, you know, I worked closely with Chief Perkins and Full Walton and we didn't have an operations chief there. It's been vacant for like seven, eight years now. And I see how he's overwhelmed with everything that he can do. Mm. And as a fireman, working the streets, you get really frustrated and you don't understand why, but the reality is, is I just don't know sometimes those chiefs are set up uh, for failure because they just simply don't have the time, resources, and the energy to do what we feel it needs to be done because we go home at the end of the tour and we're home, we're off for two days, we're off for our four days. They're not. They're sick, you know, five, six, seven days a week and it wears them out. So anyhow, mm -hmm. I just thought I'd throw that out there because I, I certainly don't want to look like I'm bashing on chiefs, um, but some of them certainly can do better than others are just set up for a challenge no matter what they do. It's going to be hard to, to meet it, you know. But I, I, I'm going to add too, you know, um, you know, for me, uh, I've been very close to a lot of people that are fire chiefs. Um, I'm lucky enough that they've never kicked me to the curb, you know, because I've been pretty rude, disrespectful to a large number of fire chiefs that have been lifelong friends you know, and I think they're more, they're definitely more mature than me. And they understand that, you know, they, they know where I'm from. And I look at them as, you know, I, I just, I want them, I want them to be better than they are, even though they're great, you know, because it's just that level of expectation when you look up to them, 
And I think that sometimes that we have these fire chiefs that I think we respect them more sometimes than we even realize we do. I know that sounds crazy. And we just want them to be perfect and be the jacks of all trades when they're balancing keeping their job, they're balancing a budget, they're balancing a union contract, they're balancing all these things. At the end of the day, I just recently realized, man, like running the calls is at the bottom of their list, not consciously, not purposely. It just happens to be that that's what it is. And the last thing I'll say is for the listener, you know, you focus on doing the best you can to support the chief that you work for, for the citizens you protect. And you should care about the chief that's in charge of people to protect your family. And then outside of that, don't worry about all the other chiefs because you don't get bogged down worrying about them. You know, even if you're an instructor. And I, I used to worry about the chiefs all over the country and what they did or didn't do. And people would call me or message me. And now I'm going to tell you, I care about two people, the, my fire chief and Shannon's boss, Kansas, because they're coming to my house. You know what I mean? And I do care about what they do, but there's still got to be a realistic understanding that they're balancing more than just when the 911 call comes in. They're, they're, they're an executive business person running a company. It is. It, 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 it's not the fun stuff that we want to talk about on a podcast. No, you, yeah. You're absolutely right, Chief. And hey, real quick, uh, before we close up with some culture talk, um, just, just a couple tips from you guys. I mean, some stuff, some little nuggets, um, you know, let, let's talk, let's talk, uh, you know, fire attack for a minute on the suburban fire ground. Let's, let's talk about maximizing, um, our water and maximizing our crews. Um, and, and give us just a couple of, you know, little nuggets, little, little, little tips on improving efficiency and effectiveness, um, when it comes to suburban fire tactic, whether it's, you know, some training, some training nuggets, um, uh, or some issues, you know, you've seen that with, uh, operations, whether it's, you know, attack packages, setting ourselves up for success, but some, some things the listeners can walk away with, Hey, you know, maybe I can go back and try this at, you know, at my firehouse that that'll, you know, hopefully improve our effectiveness as a suburban engine crew pulling up, you know, at 3 AM for that, that, you know, fire of the career or even, or even that fire, you know, that, 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 run of the mill fire that uh, can in, improve their overall uh, outlook on being successful on the fire grounds. So, so I'll uh, chief Ike, if you want to jump in on that um, and just kind of have a floor on that uh, you know, some, some stuff that maybe you can throw the listener that they can say, Hey, you know what? Uh, maybe we can get a little bit better here. Man, it's, it's in one of my slide presentations from 20 years ago when I was a captain in Escambia County. Suburban America has got to maximize the driver position. It's not a driver's convention. It's not, it's not a, you know, hook up and look up as Mike Chamber likes to call it. The driver in suburban America can make or break the fire ground, whether it's a two person company or a four person company. Um, you know, uh, uh, Chief Stone's got a guy named Woody, man. Like if I go to a fire and he's driving a rig, it's like having another fire company there, you know, like, He's just going to get – he's Woody's going to get it done, you know. And if we could get everybody to be Woody, we would all be doing great. So, you know, that that is it, uh, the, the, the driver. And I think about working for um, – Russell Beatty was my captain one time, reti- just retired Walton County. I, I was his driver back in the 90s. And he – I was like the first person <laughs> most in the history of Pensacola Fire Department that he let me – when we were going to a rig – if I if our, we were second doing, we laid a line. I didn't have to just go stand by the first two pump operator. He he authorized me and backed me up to get all my gear on, and I could join them. And that was like a cultural change in the Pensacola Fire Department because Chief Beatty. I mean, that was that was you know it was Captain Beatty at the time. And so I'm just going to leave it at. I'm not going to add anything to it. I think if suburban fire departments could figure out how to get their drivers engaged to support their officers as the senior man, senior woman. And also know that there's still a combat firefighter on a fire ground. We'll do. We'll be doing a lot better starting tomorrow. Oh yeah, great idea, Chief Stone. You want to maybe throw in, you know, weigh in on the, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I don't have like a good elaborate answer. It's just practice, man. Yeah. I mean, literally, like uh, you know, I you know, in some of the classes I teach, you know, I spent nine years as a captain on you know, downtown Fort Walton, a pretty busy unit. And uh, I tell them, I said, you know, there's a few things I would do differently if I could go back and replay it. You know, one, I would train a lot more. I would put a lot more reps in and I would focus more on the basics. And I say that because 
all the serious calls I've been in and the rescues that I've been involved in, successful, non-successful, there wasn't some one single one of them that it was something elaborate we did. It was a fundamental basic skills when seconds matter. Sometimes they worked out, sometimes they didn't. But the way that you get really good at that is just through repetition and practice. And some guys are like, well, it's kind of hypocritical, right? I mean, no, it's not hypocritical. I just didn't know what I didn't know back then. I wish somebody would have told me what I'm now requiring my captains to do, you know, and my chiefs. I have a higher expectation for them than, than, than they had for me when I was back doing it. So, yeah, man, I, I just think practice and reps over and over. That's what's going to make you measurably better. It's not rocket science. That's what sets professional teams apart. That's what sets travel baseball teams apart from rec baseball teams. I mean, you know, so yeah, just practice, man. You know, that takes us right to Sean because that's all part of the culture. Uh, Right, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything we do is built off of core knowledge of the basics, right? The basics are our building blocks. And that's anything, whether it be a fire ground or how we manage things in the firehouse. Um, so I won't get too far off on a tangent on that, but the, the biggest thing we need to understand when we're talking about culture and, and how this applies to us and, and our jobs is it's not really about what we're fighting against. And, and that's a big misconception. It's, it's what we're fighting for, right? And the, the culture is really our identity. If we're not careful with that, that can have a direct impact on our service delivery. And I think that's where we need to be putting the focus, especially if we're going to keep the, the um, conversation on fire tactics. Um, you know, it's every fire department has a mission statement and, and what's in that mission statement is generally the same to protect lives and save property. And, and it's just that simple. If you're not doing that, then where are your core, core values? Then you have to ask yourself, do they even align with reality? right? The reality is someone calls us because we're the fire department and we said that we provide this service and that we would be there. Hey, I was going to say, Shannon, Jonathan Kenzie just texted a tornado just south of me. So y'all keep going. I just got to go just check on my family. I'll be right back. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, Um, y'all. Like five minutes ago, he's way behind. (laughs) (laughs) It's that internet, right? Um, So, what, what I'm getting at really is when you, whether you're a firefighter or a fire chief or whatever your position is, if you take a look at your vision statement and you're just not doing that, then that's where really where you need to shift the focus to. How do we get ourselves to that point? Right? What is it that we need to do, whether it be repetition so that we can get better at that, or maybe we're just not doing it at all. How do we implement new policies? But a lot of that stuff, that truly starts in the hiring process. It really, really does. Um, When we're sitting in there and we're hiring, we need to be hiring for the culture we want, not just right now, but in the future, because it has to be sustainable. And if it's not sustainable, then it it doesn't matter what you do or how much time or effort you put into it. It's just not going to work, right? That's um, Peter Drucker has this awesome quote. Uh, It talks about how culture eats strategy for breakfast. You can have the best strategy that you want for your organization, but if you don't have the right people with the right mindset to lead that through, then it doesn't matter because that falls back on culture. And if the culture is terrible, then the performance is going to be terrible. Um, So that's all I'll say on that. And and I'll leave it back to Chief Stone because I know he wanted to talk about uh, culture building for tactics and how to implement that um, effective tactics becoming the norm uh, over time. So if you want to add on that, Chief, well, you touched on a really key point. Uh, you know, I, I can't remember who said this quote. You know, I'm not that smart, so I'm not going to claim it. But, you know, you want to take a look at a, at, at a department and what kind of organization and the culture they have, look at their hiring practices, you know. And we've taken that philosophy here at Midway. Um, and this is our second round of hiring. We're hiring six firefighters here in the next month. And uh, we have a real simple philosophy, and that's we want to hire the individual, not the qualifications. So obviously we have minimum qualifications, but uh, we're more, more and more concerned about hiring that right individual that's going to fit into our organization, our culture, our expectation, our core values are, than we are the qualifications. The simple fact is, is you know, me, me and other officers, we can, we can train somebody to be a really good firefighter. What we simply can't do is we can't necessarily change your value system. 
And that ties directly into the culture. So you're exactly right. I agree with you 100%. If you don't hire the right people and you don't have a right probationary program to get rid of the wrong people, or as Nick Saban would say, get the wrong people off the bus and get the right, right ones on the bus during spring training, then the outcome is, is going to be very, very predictable. Now, how does that tie into you know, your culture, because I mean, you got to have a culture beforehand. You can say that about the hiring process, but if you're not developing and building and managing that culture on a daily basis, then the hiring process is, is in itself is not going to fix it. So, I mean, how do you do that? And, and my thought process and as in align with a lot of what a lot of other people talk about is, is you've got to build that purpose driven culture, you know, and I say this in the classes that we do is that we, when you find your purpose, you find your motivation, right? Go, go think of any guy or any gal you know of this job that's really good at the job you look up to, guaranteed they love this job and they have a burning passion for it. You're not going to find somebody who doesn't love this job that's really good at it. And I think that's probably a fair statement with just about everything, right? Sure. So when an organization values Absolutely. and they, they, out, they, they lay out their core values and they lay out what their purpose is, and that goes into a purpose-driven culture where people believe in it and it becomes something bigger than them and they want to be a part of it. That's when you get momentum, you know, and I, I say that confidently because in two decades in Fort Walton, you know, I was just a fortunate to be one guy and a part of a bunch of group of guys that really made a culture swing. And I literally watched it happen over two decades, <clears throat> even the point when I retire. I mean, I, I mean, like anybody leaves their job. I mean, that, that's a part that I miss. The great thing is, is here at Midway, and I said, this can hire, they've got the foundation and we're going to continue to build upon, build upon it, you know. I, so to sum it up, you got to have a purpose driven culture. You have a purpose-driven culture, mm -hmm. you motivate your people, they buy off on it, and you talk about things. You say, well, how does it tie in tactically? Like for me as a company officer, and certainly as a battalion chief for many years, Nick mentioned it earlier. Like if you go to work, talk with anybody that, that knows me personally, whether it's Kurt or whether it's somebody I worked with, when you say children's standards, they're going to know exactly what you're talking about. Because that's the very reason we exist is to make sure that we're our best on everybody else's worst day. So and I use my children to size it up. You can't you can't beat it and you can't get anybody that's going to tell you any different that, you know, that you've got to be at your very best to go get your own children. You know, the reality is, is that, you know, my children live in Nick's district, you know, and he's him and his guys are protecting my kids and I expect them and anybody else to be on their A game. And yeah, I'll elaborate on what Kurt said. Yeah. Not everybody gets trophies in this job. And if you ever want to debate it, ask them who you want coming to get your kids guy that got just a trophy because he has showed up or the guy that really earned it at the Super Bowl, right? So anyhow, I'm kind of rambling on, but it goes into building a purpose to driven culture. It goes into the organization adopting it at the top. It goes into what Scott Thompson talks about. You want to learn more about it and really be able to like understand it and apply it at different levels in the fire department. Read Scott Thompson's book, The Functional Fire Company. He explains it way better than I ever could. And I've actually taken ideas and things that he set up and I'm, I'm using them here at Midway but it's gotta be managed on a daily basis, it's gotta be supported, and it's gotta be set by the example by the people at the top. And that starts, that, that includes your core values, it includes your operational philosophies, and it includes managing it every single day. You know, Kurt, Kurt talks about supporting and endorsing training. And I love the way he, I never told him this, but I love the way he worded it, he's right. Like people endorse it all the time, but what do you do to truly support it? You know, I can say, yeah, it's not a problem, and then you don't really provide a whole lot of support that's another element of, of the culture, of providing that expectation and that support of putting your people in a position that they're going to succeed by getting outside the organization, seeing what the fire service is doing, being open to them coming back to the organization with ideas, and then you help managing those and either, you know, implement them or not and, and, and learning from them. So anyhow, man, I'm a, I don't know if you know what I'm a big culture guy, you know, I mean, I, yeah. I believe if you, if you don't have the culture, screw everything else. It's not going to work. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can manage sure. it long, but it's never the most effective. There's Absolutely. distinct difference in management and leadership and leadership. You got to have the culture element in the fire service. If you really want to be that fire department or that high performing company. Bottom line, uh, if, if people don't buy in, you're not going to move forward. Right. There's yeah. got to be buy-in. Right. And you know, you gotta believe in if it. you hit it. Yeah. It's gotta be, it's gotta mean something. To yeah. It. Yeah. The biggest thing is we talk about saving lives and, and protecting property and, and using tactics and stuff. But I, I'm a firm believer in that a strong culture will save the most lives. And, and the reason why is because when you have a strong culture, it creates drive and performance that no policy is ever going to be able to do. Impact. Right? So, yeah, it's impactful. And, you know, just 
that alone, man, when you have that inside of your organization, that man, hold on to that because that, that is truly uh, a gem, you know, and when we're looking at culture, we, we can't just be doing things because we want to, you know, it's got to be designed and implemented with purpose, not by default. And we have to ask ourselves, like, am I changing this just because I don't like it? Or am I changing this or adding this because it's beneficial to the growth of this organization and my people? Um, and, you know, I think where we get lost in that is we, we tend to dislike things in the fire service. Maybe I don't like my attack package. So I'm, I'm just going to change it when I can, because I like this one better. That's all fine and dandy, but just cause you like that one better, doesn't mean that it ties hand in hand with what you need it to do performance wise. So yeah, triple layer we gotta, kinda, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank Open you, chief. <laughs> I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to say it. I wasn't going to say it. He did for me. So thank you. <laughs> somebody, somebody <laughs> but that's, that's the, the truth. Of it. I don't know what that's about. So. <laughs> but we're not even going to get onto it i'll just i'll say i'll go hand i'll, I'll i don't stretch lines very often but i'll tell you my guys i'll put them up against anybody and all the loads that they think is the best in the world yeah yeah absolutely you know but that's the whole point you know it's being good at what very you have carefully. yep Word. absolutely <laughs> and you know everyone's got their loads they got their nozzles they got the things that they like but in reality whatever you're you're putting into application you have to make sure it works and that it's effective because there's a big difference between efficiency and effectiveness and you know when we talk about being efficient it's great i could teach a, a monkey how to stretch a hand line and that's efficient but if i want to be effective i got to get that hand line off my truck in the best manner to the fire the quickest quickest way the fastest route you know that's how we have to do things so efficiency versus effectiveness you know and when we when we look at those two we have to add that to our culture just remember that monkey doesn't believe in ves <laughs> <laughs> you put some bananas up there he might go get it that's true there you go yeah. <laughs> so that's that's all i have unless unless anybody has anything else they'd like to add i, I just add for the listener you know when i when i do something like this i, I try to talk to you know what i needed to hear you know a long time ago and, you know, wh wherever you are down the street, you know, the grass is not always greener. They have their, their issues too. They're fighting for their culture. You're, you're not going to establish a culture overnight. I, you know, probably the most common question I get is about what we do in Escambia and how we do it. And it, everything seems perfect from the outside. It's by far from perfect. But our culture has been built over 20 years. And we started from scratch where we didn't have, you know, we didn't have old habits. And so we were kind of spoiled and it made it, you know, a little bit easier. And the number one message to that firefighter that's like, you know, the five of us that loves it is you're going to have to seek outside your organization if there's not enough people. I will tell you this. I communicate, I talk, I hang out with, uh, on holidays, the text I get are, you know, I love everybody at Scambia. They're not a Scambia guys, you know, they're Shannon or, you know, just now, my text was from, you know, Jonathan Kansas texting George Foss and I. George works in Pensacola. Jonathan works in Midway. I work here. They're the same people I've been hanging out with for 30 years. And, you know, and, and you, I do brag. I brag all the time that I associate with the same people I've been associating in the fire service for 30 years. Chana mentioned Kenny Perkins. We were firemen together nearly 30 years ago before we got promoted. But being the chief of the scam, he's the chief of them. We weren't, he didn't become my friend because he's a fire chief and he didn't give me something. We love the job together. Russell Beatty and I worked his, and he ended up becoming the fire chief of Walton County. And I tell people that people that I associate with has nothing to do with their rank. We were all firemen together back a long time ago. We just loved the job and people went different directions. And so, you know, if, if you're listening to this podcast and you, whatever culture it is you want, I don't, you know, if, I don't know if you're looking for smooth bores, you're looking for pro bars, you're looking for leather helmets, whatever it is, that's just a curtain, you know, the dressing on it. What you have to do is you've got to build people together and you got to build a team. And, you know, you can use people around the country, connections and all that, but you got to one at a time get people in your organization to voluntarily buy in. You're not going to shove it down their throat. You're not going to force it on them. And I'll, I'll tell you this. What we have in Escambia, I don't think – 
if if I would have gone somewhere else that had been a paid fire department for 50 years, it wouldn't have happened, you know? And I say that to just be honest. Like, I think it was a little easier for us to do it. And so when you're in that organization that has decades and decades and decades of tradition that can be good, it, you're not just going to change it overnight. Be patient. I'll leave it at this. Rob Fisher, 10 pounds of pressure 100% of the time. And the next person might get to enjoy it. So if it's worth it to you to make it better for the next person, then you're here for the right reason. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more, Chief. Thank you for adding that. Right, right. Well, yeah, that, that's real quick, just uh, one last thought. And, and you know, we get hung up on uh, semantics sometimes and, you know, and, and uh, the fringe stuff, if you will. Um, bottom line is find, find, you got to find a common, some common ground, right? You got to find a common mission. Um, and that mission for the fire service should be about them. It should be about what's best for our community, what's best, you know, for our taxpayers. And, and you know, if we can all just remember that fact, um, you know, whether we're talking smooth bores or fogs or, you know, leather helmets or not, whatever, all that stuff, you know, is, is all good, you know, a little poking fun and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, we've got to, you know, we've got to have a common, a common mission, something that ties us together. And, you know, with all the differences and all that stuff, you know, we've got to remember that we're, we're supposed to be on the same team. You know, we're supposed to be doing it for the right reasons. And, you know, and, and if we can bring people, I think that's where it starts is bringing people to that, you know, remembering why they got on the job. Why, why are you in this, you know, on this job to begin with? Uh, most of us start off, you know, in the fire service with, you know, wanting to help and wanting to do, you know, do the right thing and, and wanting to be good firemen. And it seems like, you know, some guys fall off the wagon along the way, whatever, but, you know, bottom line is, we all got in this job because we love it for the most part. You know, most of us got in it because we wanted to do something that made a difference. Um, and that's how you got to rally people. You know, uh, you may like blue, I like red, whatever, you know, you want a yellow fire truck or whatever it is. I mean, there's, there's all those things out there that we get, we split hairs over, but at the end of the day, why are we here? You know, we're here for them. Bottom line. That's what's got, you know, that's where culture has got to start. And that's where, you know, training and all the stuff, the tactics and that, all that stuff stems from our belief in why we're here, buy into the mission and, and the core values of, of the organization, why, why we do this line of work to begin with. And that is to hopefully save lives and property. Bottom line, you know, culture has to be built from there. And uh, I, I, you know, I'll take that to my grave. I, I, I truly believe that, you know, all of us here are talking because we love the job because we want to make a difference because we want to protect our, our communities better. Um, you know, and that's what it takes. It takes, it takes passion, some love for the job, remembering why we're here and, you know, treating, treating the job more than, you know, just a paycheck and a retirement, right. You know, remembering that what we do does make a difference. And uh, I think if you get people to believe in that uh, you're, you're well on your way to winning. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great way to, to kind of wrap it up there, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been a great discourse this evening. And uh, my sincere uh, thanks to our special guest, Chief Kurt Isaacson and Chief Shannon Stone and my, my friends and colleagues, uh, Captain Nick Pepperett and Sean Duffy of Build Your Culture. Uh, just each installment just gets better and better. Our guests just give so much. And uh, tonight was a great example of talking the basics and what's coming from the heart. The, this was not about as much tactics how to do this or that but it's what comes from the heart when you're a firefighter and you have the passion you want to do this job and with everybody agreeing that it's all based on the culture of who we are and what we want to do and then we can get to the point where we say it's who we are and it's what we do so thanks very much gentlemen really appreciate it uh, thank you for your time. I know we had to change things around a couple of times and thank you for your patience with that. We just certainly appreciate it. And uh, we hope you'll be back another time to join us. Uh, maybe within, uh, maybe within uh, make do, or maybe as uh, an individual guest with me on a future podcast. So we'll look forward to that possibility. But once again, thanks. Folk you, folks, if you're watching the video, this is going to be in the end of the video in just a moment. We're going to stop. And then if you're listening to the audio, there'll be, we'll be right back right after these words. But to our guests, thank you very much. To my co-hosts, Nick and Sean, couldn't do it without you. Thanks so much for everything you do to help Five Alarm Task Force. And uh, we just really appreciate it. It means a great deal. Thank you, folks. Stay safe and stay well.